Great to see everyone. We've been studying through the book of Luke, and we're at the very end of the narrative of the book of Luke. It's interesting because Luke kind of takes us to a point, but he also writes the book of Acts, right? He writes the book of Acts, and because he writes the book of Acts, he doesn't deal with some of those, those aspects until he gets into the book of Acts, and he begins to address that, that scene uh, that unfolds there at Pentecost and, and the various things at the beginning uh, of the early church. And so that kind of happens uh, in his narrative of the book of Acts. But we've been studying through the book of Luke. We've been trying, uh, we, we didn't always, right, we take a long time. If you did a, a, you know, kind of a harmony of the gospels kind of approach, you'd be looking at, at four different gospel accounts all the time. It could take quite a while. We've already been over a year trying to get through Luke itself. Um, and so I want to wrap it up a little bit here in the next couple of studies tonight, maybe in Wednesday, uh, to be able to do that. But I but wanted to appreciate at least some of the things that the other narratives share with us as it relates uh, to what we've been seeing. We'll do that a little bit more today. Probably won't do that then after this morning. I think the things that I want to parallel for you, kind of we can complete today, and then we'll... we'll Uh, be able to move through that uh, on Wednesday to complete, uh, maybe complete our study. But I want you, let me just refresh your memories. Go back into Luke chapter 24, and again, I apologize, this computer usually throw the verses on the screen with, um, decided it wanted to do, move to Windows 11 right now. So, so anyway, we'll figure that out later. But, but just remember, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, and then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things uh, to the apostles. That's what we studied Wednesday night. I just wanted to remind you of it because I didn't get quite finished in giving you the comparisons of what the other writers talk about. Because immediately certain things jump out at you, right? If you, if you know the whole narrative, and you may not know exactly why or where maybe that, that certain portions of it are recorded for us, but there are probably some times where you go, well, wait a minute, that doesn't sound exactly right as it relates to other narratives of the same gospel. The one we talked about at length on Wednesday was the fact that Luke records that they see two, right? But everybody else kind of puts that in singular form, right? And we had a discussion uh, about that on Wednesday. What I want us to appreciate this morning is some of the other things that the writer shared with us uh, concerning uh, this particular scene. We talked Wednesday about some of the things that Matthew adds to the narrative. Let me share with you a few things that Mark adds to the narrative uh, as well. In Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 11, that's the parallel that we're talking about from this narrative that we just read. What's interesting is when Luke's record, if you go back, he, when they get there, he just said that they found the stone what? Rolled away. That's all he records for us. That, that, then when they get there, they found the stone rolled away. What Mark adds to that conversation is, is that as they're traveling towards the tomb, they're having a conversation about what? How are we going to get that big rock out of the way? Right? They, they, they were witnesses to that. If you recall, who was it that begged the body of Jesus? That was Joseph of Arimathea, right? He goes to Pilate, begs the body of Jesus. Pilate says what to that, by the way? Is, I haven't even gotten word that he's passed away yet. Are you actually, you know, is, is, that, is it time for that? He allows Joseph of Arimathea to take the body. These, these women that had been traveling with Jesus, they follow at a, at a distance away from him, and they watch where he lays the body. They see the stone rolled over top of, of the opening, and then because what day's drawing near? The Sabbath. So the Sabbath is drawing near. It was the day of preparation. So the Sabbath is drawing near. They can't do anything on the Sabbath day, and so they figure out where he's at, 
go home and start making some things ready. They wait through the Sabbath day. They come upon the first day of the week, and on the walk toward the tomb, they say to themselves, in Mark's record, who's going to roll away that stone when we get there? Surprise, surprise, when you get there, it's already been moved. It's already been moved. In Mark's account, it's interesting as well because Matthew talks about this angel that comes down and rolls away the stone. Luke talks about these two men that appear there to them. Mark records that as a young man, the appearance of a young man that they have this conversation with. And again, we spoke a little bit about that on Wednesday evening. But, but it's interesting, verse 8 um, there, there was not to be any, of Mark's record, there was not to be any public telling of what they had saw. They were to go back and and keep that information within the apostles and those who had gathered with them. There'll be a time for Jesus to present himself before the public, right? There are going to be moments where upwards of 500 people see him simultaneously. And so their role initially is not to just go yell and scream through the streets, Jesus is risen. Their job was to go back and tell the immediate disciples and apostles what had happened and, and, and then ultimately uh, that information will spread. And then we see in verses 10 through 11 of Mark 16's account that that's what they do. They go back and tell the disciples about what they had witnessed. John's record is a little more lengthy as it relates to this scene that we've been reading through in the book of Luke. And John, in fact, gives us a whole lot more in relationship to a lot of things in, that pertain to what happens after the resurrection of Jesus. It, John, for one, identifies very specifically Mary Magdalene as the one who sees the stone rolled away. He, he identifies her quickly, and he says that she runs to tell Peter about this. John's also the one that records for us that Peter and John, they run to the tomb, but the one whom Jesus loved, who we generally identify as John, he did what? And I'm not trying to be flippant. He apparently is faster than Peter, right? He's just quicker. And, And as they're running to the tomb, John's able to outrun him, and he gets to this empty tomb before Peter does, even though the initial information was given to Peter, that's who she went uh, to tell in, in John's record. It, it's, it's interesting. Um, let's go to the record just for a minute in, in John chapter 20. because I want to share something with you that, that, that's kind of interesting uh, about his recording of some of the thought processes of some of the disciples at this time. So that's where we learn verse 2, uh, and I'm in John's account, verse 2 of John 20. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Isn't it interesting? They don't believe what? That he was raised. When they go to tell Peter about what they had seen, their conclusion about what they had saw, uh, had seen was somebody has come and taken his body out of there. And all I want us to appreciate is there's, there is a general disbelief among the vast number of people in the days of Jesus as it relates to the resurrection. It was a problematic issue for them. Now, you, you and I might argue, well, it shouldn't have been. Why shouldn't it have been, by the way? Okay, he prophesies. He, he's already demonstrated his power, and he told, tells them it's going to happen. Why else? Uh, that's right. They've already witnessed it, right? They've already seen people who have died. In fact, Lazarus died. Jesus waits long enough so people know that he died. In fact, they said when he gets to Lazarus' tomb, don't open that thing. Why? Yeah, he's, he's, by now he stinks. And again, I'm just trying to impress upon you, there was no question. Everybody knew Lazarus was dead, and yet he became a walking, living, breathing example of the power of Jesus. And when we studied through the book of Luke or earlier, you recall, we talked about the fact that, that there were folks who were not just coming to see Jesus, 
they were coming because Lazarus was traveling with them for a while and they wanted to see the guy that had been raised from the dead. Resurrection was not foreign to them and yet troublesome. She, she, she did not say to them, hey, he was raised on the third day just like he said he was going to be. She says somebody has taken his body and we don't know where they took him. That was her conclusion about what she had seen there um, in that moment. Verse 8, John chapter 20. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also and saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Here, here's the point I want us to make because it's interesting language. If I read through verse 8 and stopped... My conclusion might be that John believed what? Somebody took him. Well, well that's, actually, that is what he believed. You might, he might, you might think he believes that Jesus was raised from the dead. But the next verse tells us, no, no. What, what he believed was the story she told. That, that he had been taken because he's not there anymore. And they had yet to really wrap their minds around the power of the resurrection message. And yeah, and that and that doubt is is challenging, and and yet the message of the resurrection is crucial. W without that third element of the gospel message, if you will, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Without all three, the message doesn't hold up. And so the most critical aspect, it seems, for them to get their minds around was the resurrection. No, somebody didn't come and steal his body. No, the, the, the plot that the Jews had even... And by the way, that's the story everybody's telling. Because if you remember, when the Jews went to Pilate and, and wanted this, this tomb to be made secure, what did they tell him? Yeah, if you don't... They'll come and take his body. They'll claim he was raised from the dead. And you think you had a problem on your hands before. Wait till you have a martyred Messiah who now they believe has been raised from the dead. You'll have bigger problems than you had with him before. And Pilate says, here's, your, here's a couple of guards. Go make it as strong and secure as you can. Now, and, and I'll come back to you, Ken. Let me, here's, here's what's interesting. So they... They believe, the Jews, the chief priests believe, they'll, they'll declare a resurrection message if his body's gone. But what's weird is they actually tell the same message they, they, they had set up about how his body got stolen and is gone. We don't know where it is. Anyway, it's just kind of fascinating when you spin all that um, in your mind. Go ahead, Ken. I'm sorry. Uh, part of the reason why people have problems with it, not necessarily for the disciples, but the world in general, because the world lives by mono eat to be married because as far as the world's concerned, once you die, that's it. Yeah. And now with that, you know, it's something that we don't often talk about, but the robbing the grave is one of the part of society throughout the year. And especially since Joseph was a rich man, that would have been one one aspect that I yeah, various cultures would bury wealth. With 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 the with the deceased and and so there were issues uh, with those kinds of things. So in some ways, maybe it was easier for them to believe that somebody came and stole his body away than it was for them to believe he's raised from the dead. Um, and, and and they're working through that. Go ahead, Judy. Jews pay the guards to say that somebody comes. Well, and, and, and quite got there yet. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it is coming. Where where uh, I'll talk about that before we're done. I'll I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, what happens with those guards that go and talk uh, to the Jews? Go ahead. Well, the people today still deny the resurrection. Sure, I think they're they're still. I mean, <laughs> there are still people that deny Jesus. So to deny him as a whole is to deny everything about him, um, including his resurrection. So here's that point that Judy was just making. Let me take you back to to. To Luke first, and then and then I'm gonna share a few other examples with you from the other narratives. So, go back to Luke chapter 24. That kind of catches us up to the parallels we wanted to look at. We read through about verse 10 
reminded you of it because I just didn't quite get through these charts um, uh, Wednesday evening. So notice the language in verse 11. So their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloth lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Now, think about that for a minute. What, why, why would he marvel at a, a linen cloth that was kind of nicely folded and set aside? Okay. He, number one, that's what they had wrapped his body in. And if somebody was going to come and rob the grave, would they? <laughs> Who's going to take the time to be neat about it, right? Nobody's going to take the time and energy to take that linen cloth and then neatly fold it together except for maybe the one who'd been wrapped in it, right? And so, so that imagery that Peter sees, it should be sending... Light bulbs into his mind, but it, but it hasn't yet. And, and so he's marveling to himself at what had happened. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, we'll talk about that road to Emmaus here in a minute. Let me finish a couple of things that are parallels to that we just looked at. So Judy mentions this a, a, a minute ago. It's interesting. Luke doesn't even talk about it. But Matthew records for us that the, the guards that Pilate had sent to stand beside that tomb, when they witnessed it, right? <laughs> they, they, they were present during, during this situation. So they're witnesses to the angel coming down, the stone rolls away, Jesus is raised. They're, with, they're, they're right there when all of that happens. But where do they go to report all this information? They go to the chief priest. Why? Uh, probably scared they'll be dead. <laughs> they had been given one responsibility, and that was to guard that tomb and make sure that body stays in there until after the third day when these folks told me about this. That was the charge Pilate had given them. Keep in mind, they don't answer to the chief priest. These are Roman soldiers. They answer to Pilate. It, it makes no sense whatsoever to go to the chief priest except if you need an alibi. And so they go and tell the chief priest what really happened. They say, here's some what? Here's some money. If this comes up, you just tell Pilate that while you were asleep... <laughs> I don't know, that might get me in some trouble if I was a guard and I have to say, well, I was asleep. But anyway, while, but why would the Jews tell the guards to tell Pilate that if it comes up? They don't want to hear the truth. Okay. But think about what we've already studied about what they... What they when they went and asked for the guards to begin with. Yeah. They, they already planted the seed of that story. When they go to Pilate and say, listen, if you don't put a security around that tomb, his disciples are going to come and steal that body away because that deceiver said that in three, on the third day he'll raise it up again. And so they plant the seed of the lie before it's ever needed. I say that just for educational purposes. That's the way lies work. You, you, you plant the seed of it, and then when people start hearing it repeated, they go what? Got to be true. <laughs> it's got to be true. That's all they did. They just go to Pilate and plant the seed. His, his disciples are going to come steal that body away if you don't put it secure. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and what protection they could be, I don't have no idea. Uh, but, uh, but, but anyway, it, it's just fascinating that... They, they're willing to live this out, this lie, uh, when the truth has, has been prevalent. Now, we don't have any idea who these guards are, but we know the guards that, that, that at least one who witnessed the crucifixion has, has what? What he say about Jesus? Yeah, we, we just witnessed the death of a righteous man. I mean, the, the account had been changing the hearts and minds of even Roman soldiers throughout this process. Apparently not these guys. 
And these fellows would rather take a bribe and be ready to tell a lie to Pilate if the subject comes up as to what happens uh, with Jesus. It, it, it's, it's fascinating throughout the whole narrative how they are, they are willing to buy into to lies easier than just embracing the truth um, that is before them. Thoughts or questions up to that? Go ahead, Brian. When I was a child, they used to have these uh, cartoons like you tell biblical stories. And even then, they, that was one of the things they put in there. The cartoon I watched when I was a child uh, after the crucifixion showed two angels putting the guards to sleep. Totally perverting the script. Right, now I get you. <laughs> so, <laughs> they're trying to perpetuate the, the story that they're telling to. Now I get it. And, and it is interesting how sometimes those subtle little things um, that, that'll come up sometimes when people are retelling the story um, that aren't necessarily fluid uh, as it relates to the genuine account. Same. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been good for us, I think, through this process uh, to examine all four of the gospel accounts up to this moment, uh, in particular, especially through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I wanted to make sure that we did that. Any thoughts or questions about any of that aspect before we start moving on to the witnesses and the people and the conversations that Jesus has? Because that's the next phase. Yeah, go ahead, Marnie. No. Yeah, they're witnesses to all of it and are still willing to go talk to the chief priest and take a bribe to tell a lie, even though they saw the reality of it. Yeah, and that and, um, maybe says more about their character than anything else in some ways. So Luke's record says that towards a place called Emmaus, which, which he records, I think, is roughly seven miles away from Jerusalem. I'm showing you on the map. Let me walk up here in case you, if you've got eyes like mine lately. But... Here's Jerusalem on, on this map that I'm looking at here, and I should have blown it up a little bit more. So, so here's Bethany, by the way. Why was Bethany significant? That's where Jesus was in that week leading up to the crucifixion, right? He's staying here in Bethany, and he's kind of coming in and out of town throughout that week, leading up to ultimately he gets taken in the garden um, just outside of Jerusalem, um, and then all that process we've been studying. Emmaus is, is they believe, some of these old... Some of these New Testament places and cities, they don't, they don't necessarily know exactly where they may have been. Uh, some places they do because there's still some, some evidences of it. But they generally believe that Emmaus, just not that far, and Jesus is traveling towards that area, but they don't what? They don't recognize him. Okay? They, they, he's traveling in Ralong, but they don't necessarily recognize that. Verse 14, Luke chapter 24. So as these two, two of them were traveling towards Emmaus, they are talking together of all these things which had happened. And so it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. So fascinating, right? Here are these two guys are walking towards Emmaus and they're having a conversation about all these things that have happened to Jesus. And, and wow, what a lot to talk about over this, these last few days of the life of Jesus. And while they're having this conversation, Jesus just walks up and, and begins to converse with them. But from the narrative, it seems like he purposely what? Right. He purposely doesn't allow for them to recognize him initially um, in, in the conversation. Their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? So Jesus recognizes the kind of conversation, and the way they're talking about it, you, he can feel the what? Yeah, he can feel the sadness and mourning in the conversation. You know, the, the, these, these two men that are traveling together here towards Emmaus, and they're having this conversation about all the things that Jesus had encountered, uh, 
it, it's, it's, a sobering, it's a sobering account. And he can almost feel that, that lament and that mourning as they have this conversation. You can hear the sadness in their voice. Um, and, and for a variety of reasons. Number one, what kind of kingdom had they been looking for? Physical. A physical kingdom. And, and now all of a sudden, they're, one they'd been following is dead. Been crucified out in the open by, by the Roman power. By the way, keep that visual in mind when it comes to whether they can connect to the resurrection right away as well. Because here's this, this, this situation, and we talked a little bit Wednesday about the fact that, that this isn't the first crucifixion there at Golgotha, right? They, they, they had, this had been happening. This is something that would have been at least understood and known by the people in that region. And, and my point is, here, here's this, this open evidence of the power of Rome. Anytime somebody was led out there to Calvary to be crucified, it screamed Roman power. I have control over anybody and everybody I want to have control over. And I can put to death anybody I want to put to death. That's the imagery that they have been. So now we've got someone we believe is going to be this great leader, great king who's going to lead over us. And we just witnessed the Romans do to him what they have done to so many others who have risen up and claimed to be new leaders. It's weakening. So you can just hear the sadness, right? That they've watched him go through all this misery. Things didn't turn out exactly like they thought they were going to. What, what's the next step that we take? What do we got? So he in, comes into this conversation with that heaviness uh, on, on their minds. And so one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? I, I'm not trying, but Cleopas basically looks at Jesus and says, Are you kidding me? What do you mean, what are we talking about? We're talking about the only thing that anybody's talking about. Are you the only stranger? Is it possible that you are the one person coming out of Jerusalem that has no idea about what happened there these last few days? But he doesn't know that he's talking to the one who (laughs) endured those things. But it's fascinating, right? He's, he's almost appalled. I, you get that sense, right? You're having, a, you're having this conversation. And the mourning and lamenting that you're going through as you're having this conversation with your traveling. And here comes this stranger. And he interjects into your conversation. And, and then he has the audacity to say, well, what are you guys even talking about? I don't, and he looks at him and says, are you, you, know, are you the only guy in, in all of Jerusalem that has no idea what happened back there among those days. And so he says to him, verse 19, what, what things? What are you referring to? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. I'm, I'm talking about what they did to that great prophet that just a week ago they were ushering in as a great king into the city. And... and shouting hosannas to his name to the dark days at the end of that week when they decide that he needs to be crucified among among common thieves. Those things concerning that one from Nazareth and how the chief priests, verse 20, and our rulers... I think there's importance. Did you notice how they said it? The chief priests and... Our rulers, these were men who were supposed to be leading us. These were men who were supposed to be an example before us. These were men who were supposed to be doing the right things and and helping us. Our chief priests and rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Interesting. So number one, this isn't the plan we thought was going to happen. We had all kinds of other ideas about what that prophet was going to accomplish. Pause for a moment. When you get out ahead of God, generally you're in the wrong place. And sometimes we do that in life. We, we try to get out ahead of Him. 
And, and we, we create in our minds what we think ought to happen and what we want to happen and how we want it to happen and what it should look like. And we design in our minds what we think should occur. And then when that doesn't happen, who do we blame? We blame God. And the blame isn't God. The blame is the fact that I didn't slow down enough to let God guide me where I needed to be. I'm out ahead of him. These guys were way out ahead. They, they had conjured in their minds all this kingdom was going to look like and how it was going to be led and structured. E even even the, the mother to the sons of thunder, James and John, she had an imagery of what she thought this kingdom was going to be like. They had an idea. They're all out ahead. And besides this, it's the what? It's the third day. Big things were going to happen on the third day, and we haven't seen him yet even though they're talking to him right now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's an interesting point. I, I wish I saved enough time to finish that thought, but Wednesday we'll have to come back, Lord willing, to it. Um, but it's an important aspect. It's an interesting aspect to me, anyway, um, that they reference that um, in this conversation. Thank you for your input this morning. If you would, let's bow our heads together. We'll share in a word of prayer uh, as we dismiss. Our Father in heaven, thank you. You strengthen us and guide us in every way. You help us every day of our lives. Uh, you gave us Jesus, and He suffered all these things so that we might have hope in Him. Father, strengthen us as we leave today. Give us a heart that wants to, to know Your will and to act upon it and to recognize the consequences and challenges sin can bring, but also know the power of salvation and hope in Jesus. And go with us today. Strengthen us. Save us in the end. And we pray this through Christ's name. Amen.